this video explains the section of DNA for the biology syllabus. So DNA is found, as we know, in the nucleus of a cell. The nucleus has a few very important functions. Genes, which are individual segments of the chromosomes. They genes determine the characteristics of each individual cell. And within each gene, there is information that is used to make proteins. Um, some of the proteins would be enzymes, which control a lot of the cell's activities. We'll look a lot more at um, the production of proteins when we look at protein synthesis and RNA. Um, some other functions of the nucleus are to provide information to the cytoplasm and to the other organelles in the cell to keep the cell functioning properly. Uh, the nucleus also contains the hereditary material that is passed on to future generations. Um, and we use this so we can pass on our genetic traits. And the last thing about the nucleus is that the DNA in the nucleus uh, controls cell division or mitosis. So the nucleus has always has a specific structure. It contains a nuclear envelope of two layers over here. It has nuclear pores, which control movement of materials between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. It has a chromatin network, which is not the same thing as chromosomes. So the chromatin network is the diffuse form taken by chromosomes when the cell is not dividing. So when the cell is in interphase, when the cell is in prophase or metaphase, anaphase or telophase, you see that we actually have chromosomes instead of the chromatin network. But the chromatin network has loose helixes of DNA. They aren't wound up tightly into chromosomes yet. And the chromosomes only form when the DNA condenses together. So at the start of mitosis at prophase. Um, the chromatin network has two main components, the DNA and histones, which are proteins that stabilize, stabilize the DNA molecules, which I'll show you a picture of or a drawing of a little bit later. In the nucleus, we also have the nucleolus, or you could have multiple nucleoli. And these are where um, RNA or rRNA is produced um, and ribosomes are made. And so the rRNA, is combined with ribosomal proteins to make ribosomes that are then released outside of the nucleus. And the last thing in the nucleus is the nucleoplasm, which contains ions and molecules that are needed to make nucleic acids, so RNA and DNA, um, which are made inside the nucleus. So as you can see here, here's a drawing of the, oh, sorry, here's a drawing of the nucleus. Um, we can see the nuclear membrane with the nuclear pores around it. We can see the nucleoplasm and the chromatin network, which is the diffuse form of the chromatins. And then here's one nucleolus. So within the cell, DNA is found in two or three major places. It's obviously found in the nucleus within the chromosomes. It's found in mitochondria, where there's mitochondrial DNA. This is not the same thing as nucleic DNA. And in plant cells, so not in animal cells, DNA is also found in the chloroplasts. And this is because mitochondria and chloroplasts evolved from bacteria millions and millions of years ago, billions of years ago. Um, so the structure of DNA, if we look closer, we have the nucleus, we had the chromatin network, and now we're zooming in into the specific chromosomes and even further into genes, which are sectioned of DNA and further into each individual piece of DNA. DNA is a polymer, which means that it's a long chain of similar units joined end to end. So these similar units are called monomers. That's just the general term for long chains of similar units. The specific term for these similar units, the monomers of DNA, are called nucleotides. DNA, as we know, is double-stranded, as opposed to RNA, which is single-stranded. And each monomer, so each nucleotide of DNA, contains a phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar molecule, and a nitrogenous base. So the nitrogenous bases in DNA, there are four different ones. There's adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. There are two types of nitrogenous bases. They're pyrimidines and purines. Pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine. Um, and we know that in RNA, the um, four nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, so instead of thymine. So in RNA, the pyrimidines are cytosine and uracil. And they're a bit smaller than purines. And you can remember which ones they are. It's easy because pyrimidines has a Y in it. Cytosine and thymine both have a Y in it. Adenine, adenine and guanine don't have a Y. Purines doesn't have a Y.
So purines are the second type of um, nitrogen containing bases and they're slightly bigger than the pyrimidines. Um, so we know that the nucleotides can be four different types of nucleotides depending on which nitrogenous base they have. So they'll, all nucleotides will have a sugar, um, a deoxyribose sugar, and they'll have a phosphate group, but they might have different bases. Um, the a DNA polymer has a very specific structure, which we know was first published by, well, it's a bit controversial, but Watson and Crick and um, Rosalind Franklin also played quite an important role in that. Sometimes in the exam, they will give you one or two questions, often multiple choice questions on the history of DNA. Um, and the four important names to know would be Watson, Crick, Rosalind Franklin, and Maurice Wilkins. Um, so the, the structure that they published would be, showed that there was four specific characteristics of DNA. First of all, I'm not sure about the order, but it would be that DNA is double-stranded, that the sugar phosphate backbone is on the outside and the bases are on the inside, that there's specific complementary base pairs, so adenine always pairs with thymine and cytosine always pairs with guanine, and that the two strands of DNA are anti-parallel to each other, which I'll explain in a few seconds. So DNA has two remarkable characteristics about it. It is a store of genetic information, which means that this information is passed on over the generations, and DNA can copy itself exactly again and again and again. Um, so the structure of DNA is that the phosphate and the nitrogenous bases are both joined to deoxyribose sugar, as we can see here. And the phosphate of one nucleotide is joined to the deoxyribose sugar of the next nucleotide, so that's causing the um, sugar phosphate backbone. Each chain has two distinct ends, a five prime end and a three prime end. You'd write it like five apostrophe, three apostrophe, and say five prime, three prime. Um, it's basically just that one end starts with a phosphate group and ends at the bottom with a sugar molecule, and the other um, strand of the DNA molecule would start with the deoxyribose sugar running down and ending with the phosphate group. Um, so when it, that's what we say when we call them anti-parallel, where one end starts with a five prime group, um, a five prime end and the other end runs down to the three prime end, whereas the other strand starts with a three prime end and runs down to the five prime end. Um, each DNA molecule has two strands of nucleotides. Obviously, this is double-stranded. And these two nucleotides are bonded in the middle by hydrogen bond in between each pairs of nitrogen bases. Um, as we know that the, um, they have specific complementary base pairs, it has to be purine with pyrimidine, and it has to be adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine. This is because of the way these bases are structured chemically. And we say that they're complementary to each other because of this. Um, in the hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds between each base pair. And between guanine and cytosine, there are three bonds. Um, I've talked about them being anti-parallel, where the phosphate group is at the five prime end of the train. So this one would start with the phosphate group, sugar molecule, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, all the way down, and then end with phosphate, sugar. Whereas this one, would start this side with a phosphate group, sugar, phosphate, sugar, all the way up to phosphate and ending up here with the sugar. So they just run, they still are positioned like parallel to each other. Don't let the anti-parallel confuse you, but they're positioned running in two different directions. So five prime to three prime or three prime to five prime. Um, So each base pairing causes a slight twist in the structure. That's why DNA is a double helix structure. Um, whereas where each uh, base pairing twists about 36 degrees, causing them to twist a um, full 360 degrees every 10 base pairs. And that's where we get that double helix structure from. Um, obviously the order of the bases has to vary because that's what causes our unique physical structure and genetic structure. And we, it varies between humans, um, between, within a species and between species. Um, but all organisms will only have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Um, 
so the chromosomes are now sections of DNA where the DNA we've got these two double stranded or two strands of DNA which have joined together form the double helix structure and now um, chains and chains of monomers have formed this polymer which forms chromosomes so the chromatin network is visible interphase and early prophase and then the chromatin network condenses into form specific chromosomes which are visible in late prophase, metaphase, telophase, and anaphase, so during mitosis um, and, and meiosis. When the chromatin network condenses, so it like shortens by spiraling, that's when we can see the individual chromosomes. Um, we often see chromosomes drawn as this butterfly shape, but this is actually a replicated chromosome. During interphase and prophase and before they have replicated, they just look like a single line where there's a top arm and a bottom arm joined by a centromere. And um, this entire finger thing, long thing is called a chromatid. So during this butterfly shape, you'd have two separate chromatids. Um, the DNA is wound very tightly around histones um, when, when it forms chromosomes. And as you can see, the histone here is, histones are proteins that DNA wraps around. Um, and when the DNA is not wrapped around the histone, it allows that DNA to be exposed. So if there's a section of DNA called a gene that's exposed, this allows um, enzymes and RNA to have access to it. So it's an active gene. Whereas if it's tightly wound around, the enzymes, et cetera, don't have access to the DNA, to the gene. So it can't uh, create any proteins. So it's turned off, it's not an active gene. Um, so the chromosome network has long strands of DNA wound at intervals around these histones, these proteins. The histones prevent DNA from getting tangled, but it also, like I said, exposes the genes so that they can be actively transcribed, i.e. they can make proteins, which we say is turned on. Um, if they're in the loosely packed regions, but if they're in the tightly packed regions, like here, the DNA is not exposed, which means that the genes are inactive. Um, and this is called gene expression. So the gene's not expressed here and the gene is expressed here. So basically what we're saying is we have genes for every part of the body in every cell because we know that we have the exact copies of our DNA in every cell. But whether they're turned on or turned off depends on the type of cell. So like I said here, we have genes for eye color in our heart cells, but obviously in our heart cells those eye color genes aren't going to be exposed. And in our eye cells, those eye color genes will be exposed, but the ones controlling the heart cells, the genes controlling heart cells probably won't be exposed. That's how cell specializes. Um, so every cell type, so um, skin cells, hair cells, heart cells, et cetera, has a different gene expression profile. So which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. So DNA replication is probably the most important part of this uh, section of DNA. And it's a very good a flow diagram question. They'll often ask it or just ask a section of it. But I advise you strongly to learn this flow diagram. Make sure you know it well. Put it up on your mirror when you're brushing your teeth so you can learn it. The purpose, the function of DNA replication is to transmit identical DNA, so exact copies of DNA, to each new cell when a cell divides. This transmits the genetic information, the hereditary information from cell to cell and from generation to generation. DNA replication occurs in late interphase, just before the cell starts dividing. So it's the first step in mitosis. The steps of DNA re um, replication occur as follows. So step one, the helix uncoils. So when I say uncoils, that can kind of be a little bit confusing. The helix doesn't straighten like stop turning 360 degrees, but it unzips. So the two strands uh, break apart because these hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen spaces break, which is step two, causing the helix to unzip. Um, this is controlled by the enzyme DNA helicase. So then step three, each single strand, so this strand and this strand, are used as template strands for the construction of a new strand of DNA. So template strand as in like a mold, an original strand to copy off. So then they're free DNA nucleotides that float within the nucleoplasm. They're always floating there. These come during DNA replication and they bond to the complementary base pairs on the single template strands 
by means of complementary base pairing. It's really important to say this, complementary base pairing. So for example, if this little yellow one here was thymine, a free DNA nucleotide containing the base adenine would come from the nucleoplasm and join there, and hydrogen bonds would form between them. And this is controlled by the enzyme DNA polymerase, which catalyzes and speeds up the process. Once the hydrogen bonds have formed between the template strand and the new strand, the sugar phosphate backbone, so the adjacent sugars and phosphates in the new strand join up and form the sugar phosphate backbone again. Then this is caused by um, the enzyme ligase, um, which creates the sugar phosphate backbone and the bonds between, yeah, so the bonds between the nucleotides. This continues along the entire length of the DNA molecule so the whole length that it's been split, and the DNA molecule then recoils into this double helix. This type of replication is called a semi-conservative replication because each new molecule has one template strand and one new strand, so one old and one new strand. So they're still genetically identical because the base orders are exactly the same, but some have one side of the strand comes from the new free DNA nucleotides that were in the nucleoplasm, and one side of the strand comes from the original DNA strand in the original cell. They've, I've seen questions before where they ask you to use a diagram to explain semi-conservative replication. And this is the kind of uh, diagram I would draw where you have the original strand and you show how the free nucleotides join one to each strand of the old strands to create a new strand and how you have now have two identical DNA molecules identical to each other and to the original molecule, um, each with one strand from the old DNA molecule and one strand from free nucleotides. The last little point is about mitochondrial DNA. So obviously everything we've been talking about before is nuclear DNA. Now we're onto the DNA that can be found in the mitochondria. So most cells in our body contain about 500 to 1,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA. And it's a lot easier to find and extract than nuclear DNA. mtDNA is a lot um, simpler, but and a lot smaller as well, in terms of the number of molecules. It has 37 genes, whereas DNA has about 20,000, so a lot more. Um, and these genes in the mitochondria can code for enzymes and proteins within the mitochondria. Um, the mitochondria are structures within the cell that convert energy to food, I mean, from food into a form that cells can use, so cell respiration. And each cell has hundreds or thousands of mitochondria. Mitochondrial DNA is circular as opposed to the um, strands of nuclear DNA, the double helix chromosomal strands, and it's much smaller than nuclear DNA. In humans, um, mitochondrial DNA has around 16,000 nucleotides, so the polymer chain is about 16,000 nucleotides long whereas nuclear DNA is over 3 billion. You can see it's way, way more. Mitochondria are structurally strong and they protect their DNA. So mitochondrial DNA can be used to identify victims of mass disasters, where the nuclear DNA might be a lot more difficult to access or even be destroyed. And when there's cold cases, so the DNA, I mean, the mitochondrial DNA doesn't degrade as quickly as the nuclear DNA. So if there's a for example, a murder case that was submitted 50 years ago, and suddenly now we have another suspect. They often use mitochondrial DNA to check these suspects as nuclear DNA has degraded away. The important thing to note is that all mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the maternal line, so only passed on from mother to child. In nuclear DNA, you obviously get a portion of your father's DNA, portion of your mother's DNA, but in mitochondrial DNA, you only get an exact copy of your mother's DNA. The only changes that would occur would be from mutations. So if you're a boy, you won't pass on your DNA to your child. This is because the head of the sperm um, fuses with the egg during fertilization. The tail and the middle part of the sperm don't fuse, which means that in the head of the sperm, there is no mitochondria. Um, so when the head fuses with the egg, the no mitochondria goes into the egg. So that's why only the female DNA is passed on to the zygote. Um, 
so as I said, both sons and daughters can inherit the DNA, but only the daughters can pass it on. So it can be used to determine individuals' maternal lineage. Obviously, it has no effect on the paternal lineage because it's not passed on through males. Um, it, mutations occur a lot faster in mitochondrial DNA. They're like 10 times faster. But because it, this is because um, mitochondrial DNA doesn't have as many repair mechanisms and proofreading capabilities because it's almost not quite as vital in the role. But of course, it's still very important. Um, you can find mitochondrial DNA more easily in hair shafts, in bones and teeth because those are less likely, likely to be destroyed. So for example, if there was a mass disaster, you could look at bones or teeth or hair shafts, look for some mitochondrial DNA and try to identify a person. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much the section for DNA. I'm gonna upload some more videos for biology in the next few days. And I'll put my biology notes, these ones that I've been teaching off onto Stuvia. I'll put the link below and they should be up before the end of the week.